And welcome to the 24th meeting of the Health and Sport Committee in 2018. Can I ask everyone please to ensure mobile phones are set to silent and if you are using uh, uh, electronic devices for per social media purposes, please do not film or record proceedings. Uh, we are, the Parliament will do that for us. Apologies have been received this morning from Miles Briggs and David Torrance. Uh, but we will move swiftly on to the first item of business on our, on our agenda, which is a further evidence session on the Health and Care Staffing Scotland Bill uh, in, uh, in today's session, focusing on those who regulate, register and oversee the training of social care staff in Scotland. Can I welcome to the committee uh, Gordon Patterson, the Chief Ex Inspector of Adult Services with the Care Inspectorate, Philip Gillespie, Director of Development and Innovation with the Scottish Social Services Council, Anne Gow, who is the Director of Nursing, Midwifery and Allied Health Professionals at Healthcare Improvement Scotland, and Joy Atterbury, who is a member of the Health and Medical Law Subcommittee of the Law Society of Scotland. Welcome to you all. Uh, and can I begin with uh, a general question about the Bill and about some of the evidence we have heard so far. Clearly, the uh, Bill covers both health care and social care, which have different uh, cultures and different regulatory arrangements, of which uh, you are all, uh, in one way or another, very aware. I wonder if I can ask whether uh, the witnesses accept the view put forward in the policy memorandum that the bill has the potential to help bring the regulation of these two sectors closer together. And if it does, does it also make it easier to promote the integration of the two sectors as is uh, laid out in wider policy objectives? Who would like to start on those general points about the drawing together <coughs> of health and care? I'm Gordon, happy please. To start. Yes, please. So thank you very much for the opportunity to, to come today and provide evidence. Um, the care inspector are acutely aware that the quality of care services is critically influenced by, by staffing, by high quality staffing. And as the bill has evolved, we have taken a very clear position of support for what it seeks to achieve. And we believe uh, that it will achieve its, its policy objectives. Um, we think that because the social care sector is, is regulated, that the bill as it stands will enhance and strengthen our existing powers. Um, we believe it will bring greater focus to how providers are able to determine the optimum skills mix and, and numbers of staff to deliver high quality care. Um, and we're very content with the proposition that this should begin with care homes for adults and as the policy and financial memorandum indicate um, with care homes for older people in the first instance. We're content too that the bill has moved to a position where it seeks to adopt a very enabling approach to enable the, the care inspectorate to work in collaboration with, um, with the sector and with people who experience care. Um, and we think that it will bring greater transparency and consistency to the way that care providers um, determine the optimum staffing mix for the delivery of high quality care. Um, in terms of its contribution towards uh, levelling some of the, 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 the distinctions that currently perhaps exist between health and social care, um, the fact that it's based around a general set of principles that apply to health and, and registered care services we think is, is important. Um, and the fact that it brings what we understand to be Regulation 15 of the Public Services Reform Act, that, that condition that providers should have in place adequate numbers of suitably qualified staff, um, it applies that equally to the health services as currently applies to social care. So we see it as, as providing uh, and adding value to, to that, that, that development. Okay, thank you very much. Philip? Um, thank you for the opportunity to give evidence this morning. Um, we believe there's an effective link between sustainable staffing levels and quality of care, and we believe the bill will offer the opportunity to ensure that staff are appropriately skilled and deployed in the right places at the right time. Um, the bill also supports the continued progress towards health and social care scrutiny that is outcome focused and this is enhanced we believe by um, the health and social care standards and the new care inspectorate methodology. Um, we welcome the bill's policy intention on collaborative working across the health and social care system and the approach to enable a more rigorous evidence-based approach to 
staffing requirements for, for employers. And, I, and ultimately, I think the bill also takes account of the needs of service users and inclusive to that effect. Um, and it, it relies on professional judge, judgment and creates a safer environment for ultimately for service users and staff. Um, we welcome the initial focus on care homes, um, and this provides a consistent approach that can be applied across integration with new change in service models and multidisciplinary teams. And, um, and as a workforce regulator, we welcome uh, the prominence given to workforce planning. Um, we publish data around the workforce in terms of skills and um, qualifications uh, and workforce data that can enhance and support workforce planning more generally and workforce planning. Thank you. Anger. Um, yep, well, Healthcare, Sco Healthcare Improvement Scotland welcome the bill and the guiding principle of providing safe and high quality services. Um, and we welcome the, the focus on transparency and the needs of both service users and staff. Um, we specifically welcome the duty to ensure suitably qualified staff at all times. Uh, although we acknowledge that the common staffing method is laid out in the bill, um, doesn't entirely support that. We are working with the policy team at the moment to look at how we um, how we ensure in the next iteration of the bill that, that, that there is a response to the dynamic staffing needs day to day um, within the, the NHS. Um, we acknowledge and fully support the use of a triangulated approach in, in the common staffing method, so not just the use of the tool. Um, and having watched previous sessions, I think there's been a lot of focus on the tool and the number, um, but on that triangulation with quality outcomes, with the views of patients and staff, and then coming to a decision on what staff are needed for a service, for a specific service with specific local needs um, um, at, at the end of that, and the governance that, that boards would have to put in um, around that. And having previously been a senior nurse out in territorial boards, I have indeed, I have used the tool um, to do that and found it very successful for nursing um, and, um, and think that we can use a similar method in terms of, of assuring and improving services across the NHS. Uh, we welcome the pivotal role for Healthcare Improvement Scotland in implementing this key uh, piece of legislation and we believe it will be a key driver in assuring safe, effective and person-centred care for both service users and staff across both sectors. Um, our roles outline more in the policy and financial memoranda, but we've been given um, similar powers to the care inspectorate, which um, and the two should mirror each other. And we believe that that mirroring of roles um, will uh, provide that uh, vital piece of regulation um, that will allow us to work better together both health, uh, across both health and uh, social care sector. Um, we also believe that's important from the patients and service users and staff point of view because it really shouldn't matter where you're looked after across the social sector. You should be entitled um, to good care, good, good quality outcomes and to assurance that the right level of staff will be there to look after you. So overall, his does welcome the legislation. His feels that it fits um, with their functions and indeed will support our functions um, and will provide be real benefits for both staff and patients alike. You used an, an interesting phrase there, which I'd just like to, 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 to come back on. Uh, when you were talking about the further work that you felt was necessary yeah. with the common staffing me methodology, you said you were looking forward to the, the next iteration of the bill. Do you, do you think that there is significant change in the bill required in order to uh, achieve that uh, objective or, or do you look to secondary legislation? I think, and I, I suppose I'll leave it to um, the, the policy team and legal colleagues to decide what needs to be in the bill and what needs to be in the guidance. Um, but the common staffing method, as I understand it, as outlined in the bill, will give us an establishment. So if you have, so in a ward, for instance, um, if you've got, say, 25 to 30 patients in a ward, it might tell you you need 28 to 30 nurses, which is where, where it's been up till now. Um, what it doesn't do, though, is tell you how to deploy those nurses or give you assurance around how, how those nurses are deployed. Um, and that will extend into other staff groups. So I think it would be either within either the bill or the guidance. Um, and I see we're working with the policy team at, with this at the moment. So not just to ensure that you have sufficient people on the roster, but that you have sufficient people at all times who are adequately trained um, to look after or provide care within the social sector. Thanks very much. Joy Atterbury. Yes, and good morning. <clears throat> the, the Law Society is very grateful for the opportunity to be here. Can I just advise the, the committee that my substantive role is as Head of Litigation at the NHS Central Legal Office, but I'm here today as a member of the Law Society's um, Health and Medical Law Subcommittee. And it's our remit to look at developments in law and policy um, in the health and medical law field. 
um, in the interest of both the public and the profession. So you've already heard from the bodies who represent health professionals, um, and, and they've, they've given you evidence about that. As a committee of the Law Society, what we've really looked at are the potential legal effects um, of, of the bill. So the aim of the Act is, is clearly to provide a statutory basis for appropriate staffing in health and um, care settings. The guiding principles are set out, however they're very general, they're very multifactorial. They recognise the need for a balancing of competing priorities. And I think the real point of the Bill is to pave the way for the later introduction of regulations which are going to set out how appropriate staffing is to be achieved, um, specify the frequency with which these to use and um, create this, um, this, this model. Um, the policy memorandum refers to a policy intention of enabling rigorous evidence-based approach to decision-making relating to staffing requirements, but the bill doesn't really show us what that model is going to look at. And I think because of that, our feeling was that the bill raises a series of questions which may be regarded as significant for consideration during this period of scrutiny um, in taking the view on what we, we absolutely accept as a very laudable policy um, objective, whether that will be achieved. Um, and these include um, issues relating to bureaucratic burden, um, financial resource implications, um, whether a single tool could deal with geographic and cultural variation across Scotland, um, what is the impact on training needs, both locally in terms of using the tool, but also nationally um, in terms of um, availability of training places for um, the, the trained staff who are going to be required to meet the requirements of the, the bill? Um, we considered what the proposed mechanisms for oversight might be proposed to be. Is this going to be restricted to the reporting mechanisms contained in Section 121E? Um, or is it intended that there are going to be sanctions in the event of non-compliance? Um, is it intended that any perceived failure to comply with the guiding principles should form the basis for challenge by way of judicial review or provide support for allegations of breach of duty within civil litigation? The bill obviously is going to stand or fall by the efficacy and robustness of the tools that are going to be imposed as the consequence of the powers set out in it. And I think there's a danger of inflexibility if the tools can't adapt to changing or unusual circumstances. Um, so I, I think our conclusion, having considered the bill, was without um, sight of the regulations, effective scrutiny of this bill <coughs> um, by the effective... <coughs> excuse me, um, professions, the public, by the committee, is going to be extremely challenging. Um, we think there'll be considerable merit in more detailed scrutiny um, and further consul consultation once the regulations are in place. Thank you very much. Emma Harper. Thank you. I, I am interested to look at like, the whole overall aspects of the bill is to use an evidence-based workforce planning tools so that we can have an overarching um, bill that will allow us to build and develop and the, the whole evolution of healthcare is you know it's happening all the time. So I'd be interested to hear that like, you know the, the positives about the bill and then what's actually missing then if if we need to be adding other information. Who would like to start with that one? Anne? Yes please. Um, yeah, so in terms of the, the workforce planning tools and, and the evidence base, um, I, I think it starts from a very positive place. Um, I, I, of course, I've got a bias being a nurse, um, but based on some of the work that's happened in nursing over the last 10 to 12 years, um, having chaired the development of the community nursing tool, uh, I've fairly intimately seen how, how these have been developed, and they're, they're, they're based on current workload, which is based on the needs of the the patient population that, um, that the nurses and midwives who have used these tools have um, are looking after and take into effect the whole workload. Um, the, the triangulation, as I said earlier on, with quality outcome, we think is very, very positive um, and allows the boards uh, and IGBs to be flexible in terms of how they use that tool and use the numbers. So we think all of that is, a very, is, is, is very positive. 
the gaps, as I said earlier, are really around that dynamic day-to-day -day management. So um, what do you do when you come on shift, for instance, and you've got a couple of people off sick? What do you do if you've got a very busy middle of the winter period um, in an acute hospital? Um, what do you do in night shift if someone goes off? How do you provide that cover? How do you provide that assurance 24 hours a day, seven days a week in health and care services um, to make sure that people have got adequately trained staff to look after them? And as I see, we're doing a bit of work with the policy team at the moment ourselves in a wider group. Um, um, but, but that in, in the a bill as you've got in front of you in the guidance, um, I think there is a recognised gap. The other gaps, of course, are in um, tools for the, the the care sector and wider tools within the health sector, so multidisciplinary tools and tools that cover non-nursing and midwifery uh, disciplines. I, th I think in the policy um, like memorandum, it talks about the fact that in nursing, you know, we've had the tools for 10 years, so they've been implemented, and that's a great place to start. There's more health employees that are nurses than allied health professionals, but the whole process will allow other tools to be developed uh, by uh, for other allied health professionals. So as part of the, the process moving forward in sub-regulation, we would include other tools as they're in development. Wouldn't that be how we would manage it? Yes, yep, yes. Um, I, I do think um, in terms of the process, yep, uh, the, the inclusion of other tools, and that is in the, in, in the bill as stands at the moment. Um, I just have, I suppose, having listened to previous sessions, there's perhaps an overemphasis on the tools that are there at the moment, um, and an overemphasis on the methodology today, which might change depending on evidence base, and that we maybe need a wee bit more flexibility around that. Um, there's mention of nurses and doctors, but maybe needs a bit more strong mention within the NHS um, about other disciplines and other groups, so AHPs, for instance, or pharmacists, who are also um, critical to the both the safety and the quality of care um, of, of people in our sector. And a further uh, Gordon from the care sector. I, I think that the, what the tools do, particularly in social services, is quite a diverse um, sector, um, lots of different employers, lots of different size of organisations. It does help to start to align um, them to the na national health and social care standards because they are absolutely about what matters to the individual. And I think that also from, from our perspective, they, they fit ni 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 nicely with the, our codes of practice in terms of the values, behaviours and skills and competencies that workers are, are required to, to in terms of delivering care. So there's good alignment between the bill, development of tools and um, the standards and our, our codes of practice. And I think we have to be absolutely flexible in our sector about the different types of tools that are required for different settings, given the diversity of the sector. So it needs to be sector led and driven by the sector's needs and supported by ourselves and the care inspectorate. I'll call Hamden a brief supplementary. Just a very brief supplementary. Thank you, Convener. Good morning to the panel. Um, Anne Gao, you uh, talked both in your opening remarks and in your answer to Emma Harper there about the skills mix and indeed there might be a gap in the legislation here. We, we're very good in terms of um, defining the tools, defining you know the, the appropriate optimum staff capacity number. Do we need to amend the bill to ensure that there is that appropriate blend of training within the staff cohort? Yes, I, I think the, the, the wording could be amended slightly um, to, to, be, to make it more overt. Um, the, the tools came from a very specific place 12 years ago. Um, they were developed uh, because of some of the things that had happened and, um, and were found in large-scale reviews. So in Mid-Staffordshire, for instance, there was a strong link between harm to patients and nursing numbers. And we've got um, evidence, um, indeed, that, that we're nursing numbers in particular are low. Um, there, are, there is more harm to patients, so mortality and morbidity goes up. Um, people fall more. You don't recognise that they're getting sicker. Um, and that's where the tools came from. So it was very much about harm prevention. This bill, I think, takes it a step beyond that and to look at quality of care overall and the general wellbeing of both staff and patients. And that requires a much more multidisciplinary approach. Um, and I think the bill itself, and having listened to what other people have said about the bill, possibly doesn't describe that in the way that it should. Um, and so I, I do think that, that it could be reworded, although I'll leave that to my, my legal colleagues. Gordon Patterson. Convener, thanks. Um, to, to, I suppose, supplement that and, and respond to Ms Harper's question, I, I, think, I think it's important to recognise that uh, 
our view is that the, the, the bill articulates the need for safe and high quality services. Um, so it isn't just about how do we keep people safe, how do we prescribe the minimum, stand, minimum, minimum numbers of, stand, uh, of, ser of, of staff. High quality services for us should be defined and are defined by, by the new health and care standards, as, as Philip indicated. Um, and when we work with the sector to look at the development of tools, we won't merely be asking what is the minimum number of staff to keep people safe. It will be what are the mixes of staff doing what roles, deployed to do what tasks, with what objectives. And those object objectives should be about the ambition of the health and care standards. They should be about ensuring that people who are using care services have good lives, not just good services, and aren't defined by what they lack, but are seen as people with assets, with gifts, with experience, with, with ambition. Um, so when we describe high quality services, what we're talking about for care home population are people who um, should have community connectedness, should be included in their local communities, should be supported to have good lives, um, so we very much welcome the fact that the bill talks about high quality services and makes links um, in, in its provisions to the health and care standards. Thank you very much. David Stewart. Thank you, Kavira. Can I thank the panel uh, for their contributions today? Most of my questions are about health care improvement in Scotland, so I'm afraid Anne Gow's in the hot seat. Um, but obviously I welcome any contributions from any other uh, panel members. Um, Anga, could you explain and amplify his role in monitoring staffing levels? So our, our role to date has been um, via our, our inspection uh, regime. Um, so what, what the bill and, and the, the tools and use of the common staffing method will add for us is an ability as we develop our, our approach to assurance and scrutiny, an ability both within our quality of care approach, which I know you heard a bit about um, when you were doing the work on clinical governance, um, to look generally at the outcomes within a board or a system um, and align those quality outcomes to um, the use of the common staffing method um, and triangulate some of that with um, the views of staff and patients. Um, mirroring what happens in development of the tools and what happens in the service uh, and then to come up with some sort of conclusion that we can publish um, and make publicly available um, on the balance between staffing, skill mix, quality outcomes and um, the, the outcomes and, and views of patients and staff um, in a very general sense. Um, the other thing that it will allow us to do uh, if we do, if we, if we are if we have to do kind of specific thematic inspections is to do a much deeper dive into staffing and the effect that staffing might have on a particular area. So whether that is um, SAERs, uh, sorry, adverse event reviews for, for those who aren't aware of that, or maternity services or uh, cancer services that will allow us to align workforce numbers. Um, if we get the tools right, workforce skill mix and quality outcomes and give us an extra part of that jigsaw so that we can provide that open and transparent public assurance. Hmm. And, uh, can I move on then to an issue you've touched on already, which is looking at uh, staffing tools? And as yeah. you know, you've looked at our previous evidence. We've had a lot of evidence about tools. And one of the issues that's come up, both in oral evidence and written evidence, is the difficulty in trying to get uh, a tool or tools that both work for Greater Glasgow and Clyde and Western Isles. Is that fair comment in terms of previous evidence that we've taken? Uh, so the, the staffing method, the, the, the tool themselves, because they're based on current workloads, and they've got an aspect of professional judgment to them. Uh, in my view, and having worked with them, uh, they, they should be variable enough to be able to use in Greater Glasgow and in Orkney, um, because there's enough with that. So if you're looking just at the number, which I think a lot of people have been focusing on, then the number on its own wouldn't give you that variability. But actually, the professional judgment part of it and the quality outcome part of the triangulated method um, allows you to put some local variability in. So, for instance, in areas that I've had uh, professional oversight of in the past, so, for instance, uh, a, a 
cancer ward, chemotherapy ward, where they've also got an outpatients department. The tool would give you uh, a number for an average number for a ward of that size. Um, but because you know you're running an outpatients department in that room and in that at the same time, then the, the professional judgment part of it allows you to say, no, we need an extra five staff because we're in, in the mornings that week. We've got outpatients coming in. So it, that should allow for the variability across different population groups. Um, wards certainly vary in size um, and as, as do community teams in size and quality and outcomes, but the, the, the triangulated method should allow for, for the variability across. Um, it, it remains to be seen whether or not that that same method will, will work if we're doing a uh, joint and integrated tools, but uh, that, that's a piece of work you know, that, we, that we can do in the future. So in your view, am I right in thinking that you're the main organisation for developing and scrutinising the, the various types of tools that are available across Scotland? We, we will be um, uh, at some point in the future. Depending so I will be on right in the future, the but I'm not yes. right currently. Yes. Uh, so at the moment, uh, yeah, for scrutinising uh, workforce as part of the overall um, approach to quality, uh, yes, development of the tool sits with the workforce team at the moment who sit with CNOD. Okay. And apart from obviously health boards, um, who else are your stakeholders in the development of tools? So in the development of tools, um, health boards obviously, uh, other uh, employers and managers, so IGBs for instance, um, staff, mm. patients, uh, staff groups, unions, um, and um, I, I suppose in future, a, a care inspector with their duty to cooperate with care inspector around joint um, the, the joint development of tools within an integrated space. And my final question, convener. Um, again, as I understand that you are a key scrutiny body for, for healthcare. Yeah. Um, how can the public be reassured, uh, we've worked in this broadcast, that staffing is adequate across Scotland? And secondly, that they've got some role in this. You know, in other words, what, what terms, what consultation has there been, particularly on the type of tools we're using across Scotland? Uh, in terms of consultation with the, uh, on the tools that we've got across Scotland at the moment, I think that's probably more of a question for the existing team because I, I couldn't give you a detailed answer on that. Certainly in terms of um, transparency for the public on the, the work of Healthcare Improvement Scotland and what we would hope to do in future in terms of scrutinising the, the tools, we of course um, publish our, our reports um, asking service users about the quality of their service is something that we do as part of our quality of care reviews and we would do in our OPA uh, inspections and, and our HEI and other inspections as well. Um, the, I believe in the bill there's a, a, a um, either in the bill or the policy memorandum, I can't remember which, um, but there's an obligation on boards to annually report on whether or not they've used the tools. Um, and again, we believe this will give us um, more public, uh, more of public scrutiny on, um, on whether staffing levels are right and also whether there's been adequate attention paid to them. I suppose I did say finally, just a second ago, but finally, finally, um, obviously the public are very interested in this, but probably to rephrase that, my understanding certainly of casework that I would have in my region is uh, many constituents won't be that interested in, in management tools. They'd be interested in, if I go to a care home, is it adequately staffed? If my yeah. granny or my auntie or my uncle's in a care home, um, or in a hospital setting, what's the staffing? Because that certainly has been an issue, I'm sure, for all members here in terms of casework, complaints about staffing, and we all know the wider picture. Is that a reasonable observation that you've observed in your role in his? Um, yes, it's a reasonable observation. I, I, I think, uh, certainly in my, in my role in his and, and previously as, as a nurse out in the system, um, I think what people look at first is the quality of outcome and the quality of care that they've received. And then they start to unpick that. If that's not right, they'll start to unpick that and ask whether there, there have been enough staff looking after them um, or them, them or their relative. Um, certainly in other systems um, and in some units within the NHS in Scotland, uh, staffing numbers are published on ward doors, what you can expect today, what there is today. That's not in the bill and we haven't looked at that, but um, under some of the other work that we're doing with excellence in care, that kind of public availability of what you should have and what you do have is, is an option. Um, and some boards are working towards that. Right, thank you. Ryan Hill. Good morning to the panel. I think I'm, I'm interested in what, what, what the, the, the current situation is. Um, for example, how do the care, the, the care inspectorate uh, currently assess 
whether the provider has appropriate staff, staffing and, and what sort of support would you give to uh, 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 sort of staff planning with providers? Okay, so um, <clears throat> I think this also links to Mr Stewart's question about our role in monitoring staffing methods. So there are approximately 832 care homes for older people in Scotland and, and we inspect these every year, at least once, uh, often twice and in some situations three or four times. When we inspect, we, we inspect for outcomes, so we're concerned about how people's lives and well-being are being, enhan being enhanced by the, by the experience of, of living in that service. Um, and we recognise that this bill and, and these tools are not about outcomes, but we're, we're sensitive to the relationship between inputs, processes, resources, outputs and outcomes. Um, we see the tools as, as being an input, we see the application of those tools as being a process, and we see the determination that they bring about being a, an output in terms of how many staff working to do what tasks, at what levels, with what skills. The bill in itself won't guarantee outcomes, but it will contribute towards, towards that chain, which is probably as strong as its weakest link. We see, we see the outcomes um, in relation to how people experience care that we, we, we pick up through our inspection activity. We know that having large numbers of staff doesn't guarantee outcomes, but not having any staff guarantees poor outcomes. So there's, there's balances and judgments to be made there about, about what actually makes a difference and what contributes to good care. Um, we think the bill and the validated tools that don't currently exist in the care home sector will add value and will contribute something to ensure that, out, or to contribute towards Im improved outcomes. Um, we see it as working very closely with some of the other developments that are underway. For example, there is work being done that we're involved in with uh, Scottish Care and COSLA around uh, a dependency tool, a means of assessing the level of dependence, or I would prefer independence or interdependence that, that people living in care homes have. But that doesn't lend itself to then making determinations around how many staff are needed to meet the aggregated needs of, of, of a care home population. So we see it as being part of a package of, a, of our after measures that will contribute towards improved outcomes for people. If I could, I think, I think, we, I think we would all agree that, that, that the most important thing that uh, you highlighted there was uh, positive outcomes. In terms of when, when you, uh, when the care inspector go in, uh, and, and they're, they're currently, as you say, they're looking at outcomes. If the outcomes are not up to standard, you would then work your way, work your way back, presumably. Then, so, I'm, so I'm, I'm, in that, that case, I'm just interested in how you feel the bill and the, the way you assess will enhance and improve that process. Okay, so. I mean, we think the tools, once developed, will bring consistency and transparency. We think that they'll, they'll add something to, um, to the measures that are available to care home providers to ensure that they're providing good quality care. Where we identify that there are failings, um, under Section 44 of the Public Services Reform Act, the care inspectorate has a statutory duty to further improvement. So we don't take a view that we're only led by compliance. We think about how can we support improvement? How can we provide improvement? How can we advise? How can we coordinate the improvement activities of others in order that the quality of care improves? Um, so we, we, we have that commitment and we have that obligation. Uh, and we very much see our inspection activity as providing a diagnostic. But beyond that, we see our responsibilities around ensuring that improvement is provided either by ourselves and we have improvement support team um, or by the IGB or by the provider or by those who commission the services. So it would only be in very extreme circumstances that we would take ultimate sanctions in relation to proposing to cancel a care home's registration. Um, our init initial steps would always be about how can we make a, a situation better, even if it's a highly performing service. And how can we showcase what's working well so that the rest of the sector can benefit and learn from that in order to improve their services? But we also have enforcement action that involves making requirements where there's been a breach of a regulation or potentially um, applying for an improvement notice, which gives a care provider notice that we may 
seek to um, withdraw their registration if they don't achieve improvements within a set timescale. So there are a raft of measures that are available to us. And what we would intend in, in relation to the, 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 the bill would be that we would commend a tool that would be um, of, of value, that would add value to, to, to care providers and would enable them to better understand what the needs of their um, residents are and how they might be best met through a combination of different methods of, of, of skills mix and staffing. I, could, I think in, in, terms, in terms of uh, Kenny Spectre, its role in that sort of continuous improvement, I think that the, the, the question for me within is legislation required to, 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 to get to that end goal? So the, the proposed legislation, um, we think, would strengthen and enhance that role. We think that it gives greater focus to, to the importance of um, having appropriate staffing. We think that the tools, once developed, will be an enabler. Um, we're very keen that the bill is now framed in a way that doesn't necessarily talk about prescribing. Um, we think that the tool like any tool, should be fit to do the job that it's required to do and can add value um, when used and deployed by people who have the competence and skills to use it. Um, so we're very keen that it be seen as something that is going to support the sector in terms of developing uh, effective staffing models. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, I'd like to follow on from Brian Whittle's line of questioning to the care inspectorate, um, and then I've got a, a broader question for the rest of the panel. Um, it's fair to say, Gordon, that you have uh, your organisation has been on a bit of a, a journey with this bill. I think um, I think in your original uh, response to the Scottish Government consultation, you talked about um, the the anxieties that your organisations had about um, a further statutory requirement on the care sector, but it seems that that position's moved a bit, and that with your joint submission with the Triple SC, you say you now welcome the bill. Can I just ask what has changed to sort of bring you on board? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, our position has evolved as the proposals for consideration in the bill have evolved. The original consultation talked about the application of existing tools to, so to social care. And by that, we understood that the nursing tools would be imposed on a social care sector. We weren't confident that the definitions or the understanding of the complexity and the divergence of social care was uh, recognised in the consultation exercise. Um, and we have become content with where the bill settled insofar as care services are already regulated, but this enhances that regulatory power. And we see enormous potential in the narrowing of that care service definition down to care homes for adults and older people. So I think our, 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 we've revised our position as the government has developed, the Scottish government has developed its proposition. Okay, um, thank you for that. Well, in, in the broader question I alluded to, um, we have great concerns on this committee and have done since this parliament um, sat after the election about uh, the pressures on the integration agenda and the fact that um, there are still very much silos in our um, care landscape. Um, are you content that this bill does nothing to compound that sort of siloed culture and, and will it actually offer an opportunity to break down those walls still further? Um, I, I welcome the opportunity. I think I said earlier that um, models of care are changing, they're becoming more integrated and, and, and also um, that lends itself well to multidisciplinary uh, teams as well. So the nature of care systems changing and I think that this offers a more consistent approach. I think if the tone of the, the bill's right, it's about um, involving employers and organisations in developing the tools that work for them and, and, under, and the, the local vari variation. Um, I think the, the focus on care homes for me is, is really important because there are huge dependency levels in care homes and that is variable and I think what the tools will do will offer flexibility but understanding what the levels of need are within care homes and then respond to that accordingly. I think the public would expect that as well in terms of safety. I, I think the, the key really is in um, the close working relationship between the care inspector and ourselves and, and both organisations implicit, implicit understanding of both the health and social care sector 
Um, so I, I think to give the development of the tools entirely to either one or the other of us, um, given Gordon's feedback on earlier iterations of, of, of the bill and, and some, um, it, you know, some of the wording and the language that was used in that, because it was written from very much from an NHS perspective, uh, I think gives us a bit of insight into how important it is to have people who understand the culture, the language used and the background within each of those agencies and then to bring it together in the front line and make sure that we get um, the right numbers of, uh, and the right skill mix of staff. I, I do think that this bill will enhance that, will enhance care and will, if we get it right and we make sure that it's focused on good quality care, which is this term that we generally use in the NHS, and good outcomes, which is the focus in social care, um, then, then it, it will enable much more and much better frontline working. Anybody else? Can I just pick up on Anne's point there? And um, I, I see that you're also responsible for AHPs within his, yeah. isn't that right? Yeah. Um, are you concerned at their slight absence from the inclusion within this bill? Yeah, I, I, I think not just AHPs, but um, we need to start to talk about multidisciplinary teams within the NHS, as well as multidisciplinary, multi-sector teams when we get out into IGBs and care sectors and elsewhere. Um, so I can see where it's come from, um, because I, again, referring back to one of my early answers, um, this, the, the tools that initially came um, from areas where it was safety critical to get minimum numbers of nurses, um, and then of course the next thing is doctors to reduce harm. Um, if we're talking about quality of care and quality outcomes and well-being for staff and patients, then not just EHPs, but all staff groups need to be considered um, within both the NHS and that integrated context. Um, and, um, and I think that's one of the, the changes that we maybe need in the bill is to have wording that reflects that and gives us the flexibility to make sure we get that, that right skill mix of staff, um, depending on which setting that, that we're working in. So you think this bill can be amended to cover the concerns of AHPs and multidisciplinary workforce that you, you described? Yes, yep. yep. I look forward to working with you can, on that. Can, can I ask uh, Joy Atterbury from the Law Society's point of view, you talked at the beginning about the uh, need to know what was going to be in regulations in order to have uh, full scrutiny. What is your view of the bill? Clearly, uh, there, there is scope for amendment. Uh, how much amendment do you think it requires in order to be fit for scrutiny, uh, quite apart from fit for purpose? I think I think our difficulty was that the bill is a standalone. If and and I am not aware of this ever happening. If we'd had a set of regulations going along with it at this stage, it would have been very much easier to have sure. um, answered the questions that um, were were raised with us. And and you know, to be fair, I think most of these questions have been reflected by by colleagues. Um, on on the panel um, but certainly um, this whole issue of um, competing priorities and any um, implications for multidisciplinary teams and um, allied um, professionals allied to health um, was one which had particularly occurred to us and I think if there's an opportunity to um, introduce that into into the bill, then a number of the concerns which are expressed by colleagues could be um, resolved, um, and we won't wouldn't have this um, you know, continuing gap in understanding which which would at the current time exist until the, the regulations are, are drafted. That's um, that, that that's very helpful. Mm. Thank thank you very much. Can I ask Philip Gillespie about the role of Triple SC currently? but also how far you anticipate a role in the development of workforce tools as they're applied to the social yeah. care sector. Yes, thank you. Um, at, currently at the minute, we, we hold a lot of um, workforce um, intelligence around the, the sector in, in terms of um, social services. Um, um, over 100,000 uh, workers are registered with us, so we hold a, a whole range of information about skills, competencies, um, and where they are and where they're employed. So our role in, in the National Workforce Plan is to support that in terms of providing data for planners at local level that they can do integrated planning. So we publish, we, we also publish official statistics on numbers of um, mental health officers and workforce skills within Scotland. So we have a rich, a rich um, um, uh, library of information that we can lend to support workforce planning more generally. And we're doing work under the <coughs> National Workforce Plan uh, work that's going in tandem with this. Sure. And with the development of tools for 
the care sector? How far do you see an active role in that process? Certainly we would want to be a key partner working alongside the care inspectorate with that and that was outlined in our, in our submission. We see a key role for us in, in terms of that. Thanks very much. Sandra White. Uh, thank you very much, convener. Good, good morning, everyone. Thank you for your evidence so far. I just wanted to pick up with uh, Philip Gillespie, obviously, you, uh, you have put forward and, and we've read in the committee about wanting to be a key worker in a role along with the, the, the care inspectorate. But unfortunately, the Scottish Social Services Council, yourselves, uh, basically is not really mentioned in the bill. Now, do you think that is an oversight, or should that be changed, considering what you've just said about you are starting to work uh, together, uh, basically so to ensure that the staffing is safe and appropriate? Yeah, I think I think that what what I do welcomes the prominence of our own workforce plan and workload plan. I think we have a key role, and I think that does need to be enhanced within within the bill. We already have we already have powers on in, under the Regulation of Care Act for for workforce planning that, that are there. So I'd like. We would like to see those enhanced because I think we are a key contributor to workforce planning and workload planning for, to support employers and work with the care inspector. Right? Yeah. And I see Mr Patterson nodding his head, so I'm assuming that you're in a agreement with that as well? Absolutely. Yes, we, we've made representations to the bill team that we think the SSSC should be explicitly referenced in the body of the bill as um, amongst the partners with whom we would collaborate in the development of tools. And if that doesn't feature through amendment, it, it may well be articulated through the regulations and guidance that, that follow. Thank you. Um, can I just go further on in, in how the bill could work and hopefully will work, basically, uh, and it's basically for the SSC as well. Uh, would the bill, as it's proposed at the moment, uh, basically, you know, how, how would it help to balance the duties of the Triple SC uh, and regulation, registration, that type of thing? You mentioned yourself before about the diverse workforce that you have and the motivation. Uh, where some people obviously wish to, you know, expand their career. Uh, and we also know the workforce is sometimes a bit 45 and older at times as well. So, as the bill is proposed at the moment, uh, how do you think that will affect? what you're doing just now, will it enhance or should there be some changes? I think it will complement the work that's going on around um, national workforce planning. So we're leading on the development of career pathways for um, social services so that people can plot um, a career in care and also a career potentially into, into health as well. So we're trying to integrate some of, some of those pathways. Um, I think our role as well that obviously we, we, we investigate um, as part of our function fitness to practice cases as well or where, where there's issues, potential staffing issues, or um, we share that intelligence with, with the care inspectorate. So we have a, a body of evidence that is um, that will be helpful to employers, but we also, I think, ultimately, the data that we hold around the workforce and the diversity of the workforce um, will support workforce planners and, and IJBs at, at a local level. Mm -hmm. So just to, to you know, go further on in that particular <coughs> point, so if you are a stakeholder and it is in the face of the bill or in the legislation of, of the bill, um, I'm assuming that others, yourself, Scow and others, would be working to ours, including uh, training, etc. as well. Because one of the things is basically the development of the social workforce, social care workforce as well. So how will it help to do that? Do you believe it will be helpful in that respect? I think what it will do is, um, for employers, it will give them um, an overview of the skills um, that people have, the qualifications that people are working to. Um, uh, as you know, people that are registered either have a qualification or they're working towards a qualification. So that, uh, that intelligence mm -hmm. will be helpful to employers about what they need to do, what they need to plan to ensure they have um, the right people with the right um, qualifications and skills to carry out the job. So we have that information which we can share with employers in terms of their workforce planning. Okay. And just one for, for all the panels. So, sorry, I kept on yourself, Mr Gillespie, in that respect. Uh, Brexit's uh, looming on the horizon. And obviously, we're looking at the moment at potentially perhaps shortages in social care staff. Um, what do you think the outcome is going to be uh, in regards, you know, if Brexit happens and we have this bill? Um, any thoughts on, on that? Obviously, on the lack of uh, staff. Debate Brexit, but if there are uh, aspects of, of question, the bill which are affected by, uh, <laughs> by that, then feel free to comment. Anybody? Um, Gordon Park. So, I, I think, I think um, it's important that we recognise the significant staffing crisis that is impacting on social care at the moment, which will be no doubt compounded by Brexit um, when, if it happens. Um, the 
Section 80 of the Financial Memorandum outlines that this legislation is not intended to address the wider recruitment challenges. Um, so that, that doesn't mean those aren't important, but as, as Philip says, that there's work going on elsewhere in relation to uh, the National Health and Social Care Workforce Plan um, that, that should seek to address some of those challenges or, or mitigate the risks of, of them. Um, for me, I think, or for us, the bill will potentially identify what the challenge is. It will potentially identify that there is a shortage in some aspects of the work, some, some uh, areas of the workforce. But it may not. It may identify that there are more effective ways of using the staff that we've got at the moment to work to grade, to work at a different level, uh, and to, to, to deliver good care through different configurations and different arrangements. Um, I mean, the committee may be interested in work that we did with 40 care providers in Scotland uh, a couple of years ago, where they were struggling to recruit nurses, and they were over-relying on agency nurses, which was costing significant amounts of money and not providing a good quality continue, continuity of care. So we worked with 40 care homes who were looking to reconfigure their staffing approach by reducing nursing, by um, bringing in peripatetic nursing, by bringing in nursing assistants, by up, upskilling senior carers, uh, by reconfiguring how they provided nursing overnight, um, and by looking at how community nurses could inreach, and they might not necessarily be provided by those care homes themselves. So we worked with them and tried to enable that type of innovation recognising that we have uh, to maintain safety and, and good quality of care. Uh, and they were able to reconfigure. Um, we required them to have in place arrangements to discuss, discuss their proposals with the local commissioners, uh, quality indicators and measures to determine whether or not this was effective. Uh, and a year later, we, we went back to inspect these 40 care homes. Um, and we identified that four of them, their, their grades were were lower after we inspected. Um, nine were improved, so their grades had improved, and 27 remained the same. Now, four out of any 40 care services, grades would change over the course of a year and, and, and would deteriorate. But what that did was enabled um, the care providers to look differently at how they configured their existing staff, to be innovative, to bring forward solutions, to engage with partners, uh, and to develop an approach that um, enabled a recognition of the importance of nursing, but also a recognition of how scarce that resource was to make sure that it was being used only on nursing tasks that needed to be done by a nurse. Now, that was only 40 care homes that looked to do that with us. We would like to create the conditions for all care homes to have a tool to be able to do that in a more consistent way and to deliver outputs about what sort of numbers they need, but also outcomes about how we can make sure that people are getting good care. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, just a very, I can nod ahead, do you think this bill will include that and, and it would enhance that innovation then that you're speaking about? I think so. By bringing, by, by designing, co-producing, mm -hmm. collaborating with, with Scottish Care, with COSLA, with the sector, with care providers, with SSSC and, and, and his, as we did when jointly with his we developed the care standards on behalf of the government. So a, a real collaborative approach. We think that we'll be able to develop a tool that will add value and that people will feel is, is something that they want to use. And by using a validated tool, um, greater consistency and transparency will be brought. And we'll be clearer about where the staff and pressures are to, to link back to your question about workforce planning. Um, and that work can be taken elsewhere in relation to the, the workforce developments nationally. Okay. I think, as, as Gordon highlights, the bill, as, as it stands at the moment, um, doesn't compel uh, employers to have a specific number of uh, a specific, specific staff number, but actually does encourage them to do some of the redesign work to ensure that, that, that services are safe and are, are of high quality. 
Um, and I, I think it will be, if we get the workforce tools right across that whole multidisciplinary sector, they should give us the information and a deep dive into workloads that will allow us to make sure that we've got the right people and um, with the right skills in the right place um, and to make the most of our workforce going forward. So whether that's impacted by Brexit or it's impacted by our population changes as people get older and we've got fewer and fewer young people coming into each of the sectors, it will or it should allow us to become more efficient um, in terms of use of our workforce as it, as it stands. Okay. Uh, Emma Harper and then Keith Brown. Just really to reiterate, in the policy memorandum, it says that uh, the words multi-agency working across a range of professional uh, professionals and staff groups is mentioned and uh, the ability to redesign and legislate using multidisciplinary and multi-agency teams. It's all in the policy memorandum to specifically look at the emergence of local multidisciplinary teams so that both health and social care backgrounds are, are enabled to develop tools together. So, And I'm aware that like different urban A&Es and different urban med surge units and even care homes might apply different staff to do different things. So some a and &E units have more nurses than others or more doctors than others. So wouldn't the staffing bill or isn't the, the purpose that we have a standardised approach and an evidence-based way to, to look at staffing so that it also can be flexible between urban and rural so that we can look at a proper base for developing uh, guidance on staffing so that we can have safe staffing and go so i i think it will enhance some of the the, the, the multidisciplinary issues that the IGBs, for instance, are dealing with at the moment and which we've, we've dealt with in both sectors. So, again, it's about developing the tools in the right way. So, if we're developing a multidisciplinary tool, it's about looking at, in that multidisciplinary team, in terms of safety and quality of outcome um, for the people who are using the service, what can only a social worker under the regulation that they they use do, what can only a nurse do, what can only a doctor do, and then what are the bits that you can kind of blur around the edges, what, what can what can support services do. Um, and I I think it, it shouldn't matter whether you live in a rural area or whether you live in an urban area, your right to that safe care should be the same. Um, but that the key will be in the flexibility locally um, and making sure that you're using the small number of very highly qualified staff that you've got to do the bits that only they can do. Okay. Very much. Keith Brown. Hey, can I thank the panel for their contribution? It's been really useful to hear, obviously, general support, but also where you're not um, happy or content with how things are, the constructive suggestions which have been made. A lot of the panellists that we've had before have mentioned the interests of patients. I think for the first time, I think Anne Gow's mentioned the views of patients. And I just wondered how that can be taken into account, the views of patients, either in development of the tools or the implementation of the bill. You want to kick off Anne? Yeah, I, um, and again, as, as I've said, we, we've not been responsible for tools up to now, but certainly it would be our intent. Um, within Healthcare Improvement Scotland, we've got the Scottish Health Council. Um, we have a, a network of external um, advisors who, um, who come from various patient groups, and it would be our intent as we're developing tools to ensure that both patients and staff are involved in the development of the tools um, and also that we consult people within services as we are out providing assurance um, and improvement of how the, those tools are used. So just, I think, to reiterate what I said earlier, um, Andrew Strong, who gave evidence to the committee last week from the Health and Social Care Alliance, commended the work that the Care Inspectorate and Healthcare Improvement Scotland had been had done in, in developing the, the national health and care standards. And we very much see that that same approach could be brought to collaborate on the development of, of staffing methodologies. So that's about a, a high level stakeholder group. That's about engaging with the sector. Um, that's about organisations who represent people who experience care and use services, as well as those people themselves. Um, collectively coming together to um, determine what is needed and, and how it can best be brought to effect. So we would very much take that collaborative approach that we did in the context of developing the care and health standards with Healthcare Improvement Scotland, and which, which has been commended, um, 
And, and there are other such examples. You know, one of the criticisms that the committee's heard or one of the cautions that the committee's been asked to consider is the extent to which a regulator would be marking its own homework if it was to design tools and then inspect against them. We've, we've done that. We do that all the time. We don't think it's a conflict of interest. We think it's about our interest in ensuring that care is good. So jointly with um, the SSC, we've developed national guidance about safer recruitment, about how to recruit in a way that ensures that um, people are you know, going through the disclosure process, um, the recruitment process, how the balances and checks can be built in. And we've brought that to the market, who, and it's now universally used and accepted as a good practice guide. So then when we come and inspect, we say, well, if you aren't aware of good practice, here's a guide, and maybe you need to think about that moving forward and improving your services. So we don't, we don't see that conflict. Can, can I take you back to Keith Brown's question, though? How would you ensure the views of those who use services are, are in, included in the development of tools? So we, we would do that through the tool development process by engaging with, with people directly, by involving those who represent them. But we do that all the time when we go in to inspect services. We speak to people who use services and we speak to carers. We have recently developed a new methodology which is about inspecting through the lens of the new care and health standards. And that significantly shifts the focus of our activity towards people's actual experience of care rather than policies and procedures. Thank you very much, and can I say thank you to our witnesses for their evidence this morning. That's been much appreciated. We'll take a short break to allow a change of panel, uh, and no doubt we will uh, hear from you all again as the process goes forward. Thank you very much.
very much and we're now able to resume our session and welcome to the committee our second panel this morning. Uh, can I welcome Karen Wilson, the Director of Nursing, Midwifery and Allied Health Professionals at NHS Education for Scotland. Joyce Thompson, who is Chair of the British Dietetics Association Scotland Board and Dietetic Consultant in Public Health Nutrition at NHS Tayside. Dr Tony Axon, National Officer Scotland with the Society and College of Radiographers. And Tracy Darling, Regional Organiser for Local Government Scotland with Unison Scotland. Welcome uh, to you all this morning. And can I start with the um, question with which I began our previous session, which is, broadly speaking, uh, the Bill proposes that the measures in it, or the policy memorandum proposes that the Bill can help bring closer together the different regulatory uh, systems that apply to health and social care and uh, cross some of those bridges. Uh, I'd be interested in the view of witnesses as to whether they believe that's right and also whether they believe that the changes in the regulatory regime, which the Bill implies, uh, can also help with the process of integration of health and social care. Who would like to start? Who would like to take a... Okay. Yes, please. Start. So, um, I'm speaking on behalf of NHS Education for Scotland. We're a national health board with a crucial role in the education, training and development of Scotland's healthcare staff. Um, NES has been involved in supporting the nursing and midwifery workforce planning since 2008 uh, with the co-production and publication of the first edition of the nursing midwifery workload and workforce planning toolkit. And I have the learning toolkit um, here with me today. Um, we are currently contributing to the national programme through membership of the steering group and chairing of the education and training subgroup. Um, NES although it's NHS Education for Scotland, um, has been working very closely with uh, SSC and um, other care providers um, out with the NHS um, to ensure that when we produce um, educational materials or development materials, they're suitable for um, any of the health and care professionals. So um, we would be producing anything to support the bill um, in terms of... Um, making sure that it was suitable for health and care. Um, so that's our position. OK, thank you very much. Joyce Thompson. Yes. Good morning. Um, as you pointed out, I'm here on behalf of the British Dietetic Association um, Scotland Board. And for those less familiar, may I also uh, say a couple of words in relation to dietetics, because it's one of the allied health professions. Um, and we are unusually one of the um, nutrition bodies who are statutory regulated. So um, our role and function is um, to translate everything to do with food and nutrition into practical guidance for people. And so as an autonomous practitioners, we're able to assess, uh, diagnose and treat nutrition um, and diet problems, both from an individual point of view and also um, from a population point of view. So in relation to um, your, your question, um, the BDA, just as we did um, put in a written um, response, um, does welcome the bill's aim uh, to provide safe and high quality um, services. Um, and like the previous panel, also to highlight that we are one of the allied health professions and therefore we very much uh, would promote that there's be consideration to the development of tools and the application of these methodologies um, in relation to professions beyond nursing. Tony Axon. Yeah. Um, Representing the Society of College Radiographers, um, we're mainly actually hospital based. So it's, it's slightly difficult to answer that, that question because um, we're not really in, in the social care sphere so much. Um, but uh, similar to my colleagues, we, we would be keen to see the development of these tools to be also to work with, with radiographers and, and other allied health professionals. Uh, we would support that and we support the, the principles of the bill. Thank you very much. And Tracy Barry. Um, I suppose my contribution spans... Uh, largely all of the workforce, no matter where or what setting, um, they're, they're delivering care. Um, specifically in relation to your question about bringing de together the different regulatory systems, um, I'm not sure the bill will do that, if I'm, if I'm honest. The regulatory systems are the regulatory systems. Um, and we, we still have a whole number of the workforce who are not covered by the regulatory system and won't be until 2020, specifically the home care, uh, which is the personal care that's delivered within 
um, individuals' houses. So, in terms of that whole fitness to practice for individuals, um, each regulatory body will have its own uh, arrangements for, for the assessment of that. The integration, I think, uh, element is probably critical to this in terms of service delivery and the contract compliance. Um, we already know from our own experience of, of um, workers out there delivering social care in, in, a, in a home setting that the contract compliance is um, threadbare, I think I would probably say, both in relation to uh, pay for the individuals, but also in relation to some of the practices um, of, of 15 minute visits and, um, and, a, and a lack of, of general equipment and time uh, in order to deliver the service. So I'm not sure the bill in itself will address some of those issues, particularly since most of that falls in part three and it's not prescriptive really at this stage. Um, but it's certainly a move in the right direction. Okay, thank you very much. Brian Whittle. Yeah, good morning to the panel. I think kind of in the last panel, I wanted to kind of look at what's uh, it's currently in play, and uh, I wonder if, if, in terms of training and sort of continuing professional development, what uh, what considerations are currently given, uh, and what you know, covering sort of patient safety. Um, so certainly, in relation to um, the implementation of the workload and workforce planning tools, um, as I say, there's a learning toolkit for people who are actively using that methodology. Um, so within the current nursing and midwifery workforce, that would largely be the senior charge nurses and the equivalent out in the community uh, for the community tools. So um, there's a development process there for people who um, are going to be using the tools. Um, we recognise that um, in the case of nursing and midwifery, the senior charge nurses and their equivalent are the kind of linchpins for delivering safe and effective care to um, patients. Um, so again, we're considering how we can refresh um, the previous process we had, uh, which was called Leading Better Care, which is specifically around um, ensuring safe and quality care for patients in clinical settings. Um, and again, as I've said, um, we intend to make sure that all of our um, educational resources are suitable for health and care. Um, so as the tools develop, we will produce materials that um, help to support staff to understand and use uh, the methodologies effectively. If I could, um, so does, does the bill enhance that process? I think what, what I asked the question earlier on in, in the previous panel is, is it is legislation required to, 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 you know, to enhance uh, the process you're currently going through or, or are you already on that journey? Well, to a certain extent, I think we are already on that journey, but I think, um, as has been um, said in various fora, that um, the application is a bit patchy, and I think that's where the bill comes in. The legislation supports um, consistency, um, and I think that's the key strength of it, as far as I'm concerned. I think, finally, if I could, um, the... It's the imp implementation of the bill in terms of uh, having access to training. Um, how, how will the bill change that? Will that, will that put more pressure uh, on the sort of training element? Yes, and there is already an infrastructure being introduced to support um, the um, implementation of the bill. So I think we're already seeing that there's a stronger infrastructure to support uh, the training and development of staff. Um, and it is about giving people the space and time um, to actually undertake the training. I think the training's there, it's available, and it is uh, the prioritisation that this kind of legislation process brings to bear that um, is an added strength for us. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much. We heard from the previous... Uh, yes, Tony Axon, please. Um, for radiographers, there are, they are degree-level um, staff, but they need to be trained in, in, uh, on, in hospitals to, to get greater expertise and move up the system. But they're also regulated by, by the, the HSPC and so required to take out so much CPD every year to, to, to carry on that regulation. Uh, and the issue for, that we often see is that the time for training is, is often not, is, is, the, is the thing that's, um, it's the last, it's quite often not um, able to do that because you've got all the pressures on, on 
delivering the, the rotor and delivering the waiting list. Um, so we see the bill has been adding in that time because if these tools are applied to, to our staff, they're much more likely to be have that time to do the training. Right. Things I, I, I did want to ask, I forgot earlier on, I think this, this idea of what constitutes uh, you know, safety and risk across professions, because it seems to, to, to vary a little bit, and I wonder if there's if there, if there are different views on that, and, and does the bill account for these differing definitions? Uh, I think on, on safety, um, this is part of the reason we want to see um, an extension of the um, of the tools to to our practitioners, because we are dealing with um, radiation. We're dealing with giving radiation to members of the public, and making sure that um, our staff. Um, are not overworked and um, have, are, are on uh, rotors that are not too long. I mean, there's still rotors at the moment uh, in a hospital for 16 hours. Um, making sure that so that we we see the extension of these tools is, is helping with with safety in those because it making sure that staff aren't working too long and are getting proper rest. I think there's a whole variety of measurement tools out there and, and, and that's fine if that's all you want to do is measure it for statistical purposes but if you want to ensure compliance then we're back into that regulatory framework about who is responsible for compliance um, and we still have you know, a, a large chunk of the social care workforce that are not governed by any form of regulation just now so it's going to be largely be down to the employer. Um, to, to undertake that role mm. and that will vary um, I mean the 32 local authorities will have different continuing professional development tools measures um, there will theoretically be thousands amongst the private care providers um, our experience would say that that theory uh, can't be proven and that there is very very little there by way of continuing pre professional development and and staff training uh, as my colleague said here, it's often the thing that costs the most and is dispensed with uh, when there are other funding pressures. So um, I, I'm not sure that the bill builds in that compliance element. It may well have the kind of uh, the, the framework for it, but I, I, I'm not sure that it's there on compliance. Thank you. Um, in relation to your question, particularly about safety, just reflecting again that this bill is also about high quality services and certainly don't want to lose sight of that. Um, but I think this is another reason why it would be good if it was extended uh, specifically to other professions, but also took a multidisciplinary or a multi-agency approach. Dietetics um, historically has been a very demand-led service and the reality of that is that continuing on that premise, um, there are more people in need of dietetic intervention than there ever will be capacity to deliver. So in order to truly get upstream, not just from a preventative point of view but from an early intervention uh, perspective, what that is currently meaning is that dietitians amongst other professions um, are working in partnership with others in order to truly um, redesign pathways which stretch across systems. My reason for bringing this up as an example is that within that, that also provides the opportunity and the need for professions to extend their scope of practice. So that very much um, reflects the need to specifically look at safety um, and I think enhances the need for a very multidisciplinary approach to this. Um. Sandra Park. Thank you very much, presiding officer, presiding officer. I'm dreaming here, sorry, but I may be elevating you onto some greatness. Uh, thank you very much, <laughs> convener, in that, in that respect. Uh, thank you for your evidence as well and uh, good, good morning too. I was pleased to hear you say, uh, Karen Wilson, <coughs> excuse me, in regards to learning toolkits, because we had in previous um, submissions the fact that um, they felt that people weren't trained up and educated enough in using the tools. Uh, so would you say, ongoing, uh, as the bill goes forward, actually giving more training to staff could actually perhaps more accurately assess where staff are needed more, and that be part and parcel of the bill? 
with more training and more, more education to use the tools properly. Yeah, absolutely. The more we prepare, as I said, senior charge nurses and um, their equivalent in the community to understand the importance of safe staffing, um, the better um, the service will be. Um, I think, as I said, there's, there's an infrastructure now being put in place because of this. I think one of the problems before was that if areas use the um, tools, they use them once a year. And you can't remain competent in something if you only do it once a year. Um, so I think that having an infrastructure there and running the tools really regularly um, over the whole of the kind of health system will mean that expertise will build and people will become much more confident in the methodology and the information behind it. Could I ask, sorry, Chair, can I perhaps ask Tracy, darling, you mentioned the fact about the workforce and the non-compliance and the different local authorities and different practice. Will they be getting trained in these tools as well? Or will it be the management level just? Imagine it would be the management level. Mm -hmm. it, it's hard to say at this stage, but at, at the moment, that's what I would anticipate. OK. Uh, could I just take it a wee bit further? And uh, you mentioned about, uh, basically, various professions being involved, because obviously it's not just coming from the top, it's going right out into uh, the communities. So I was just going to ask, you know, what... Um, body or bodies do you think when we're developing the tools and the new mythologies uh, should actually be involved in this? Should it be the professions, uh, the sectors, the regulators? Should it be everyone who's involved in this or would you need to stop at some level of involvement for new tools and new mythologies? Certainly my um, knowledge about uh, the development of the workload tools is that it, um, when you're actually developing a new tool, you work with the people who are working with the clients or the patients. And I think that's really important that it, at that point it is ground level staff. It's the people who are in direct contact who are providing the evidence of what the workload is. Mm -hmm because nobody else knows the workload apart from the people who are um, actually delivering. So I think it is important to involve the right staff for the right kind of levels of decision making and, and being involved. Mm -hmm. I completely agree. It needs to be from the ground up. Um, mm -hmm. These tools are a long time in development um, because they have to be evidence based. So you're going to have to involve the people who are, who are using it. I think one of my concerns is, that, is the procurement element of this. Mm -hmm that when you are procuring the service, who do you involve in, in, in terms of, of developing mm -hmm. that? Um, some of these services are well established, but there are a whole range of, of social care services that are procured every day of the week mm -hmm. based on particular needs. Um, so whoever is involved in this is going to have to be you know, able to cover that you know, entire uh, social care setting, particularly in homes. Mm -hmm. Do, sorry, um, do you think that should, I'm not necessarily on the face of the bill, but that should be in some guidance then uh, in regards to the bill? Uh, you know, my concern would be that whilst well, we've got the management level and the professionals, it doesn't filter down to the workforce on the ground. Uh, I don't know how you'd word that, and I don't know if there should be a timing taken into consideration, an adequate timing to to look at these new tools being developed or not. Do you think that would be some form of guidance then? A time scale and also the fact that you've got to include all of the workforce? I think a time scale would be very, very helpful. Um, as you'll note from some of the comments I've made so far, whilst very supportive, we have concerns about particularly some of the smaller professions around this. Mm. And I think that, um, again, history dictates that um, frequently uh, work focuses on bigger professions and it takes a long, long time for the smaller professions to be addressed. And I would like to see something which would ensure that there was almost parallel uh, work streams going forward in addition to a multidisciplinary approach. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I said before, we certainly support the, the um, information of tools to other, other professions. Um, and the, the advantage of the tools is it's not just looking at numbers of, of people you're treating, which is what tends to be happening at the moment. It's also looking at the professional voice on that. So it has to involve the professional, mm -hmm. professionals on the ground to, to do that. And that means that those decisions then on running the tools are done at a, a, a reasonably low level, so not at departmental level, say. And on timescales, um, there has been some talk about how long it's taken for some of the tools to be mm -hmm. developed. But a lot of those tools are already sitting there. It's just a matter of 
revising those tools to fit in with other professions or, 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 the multi, or making multidisciplinary tools. And I, but I think it would be useful to have some of that on, on the face of the bill or certainly in the guidance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, could I just add that those tools are there in, the, in that kind of acute or, or building mm -hmm. setting where it is much easier to manage mm -hmm. uh, workload or, or workforce planning within a, a building. And, and that's why I, I would say that this does helpfully suggest that the social care element starts within care homes where it becomes far more complex is when it is out in the community based in people's homes. Mm -hmm. Chairs, oh, sorry, just just a very, very, very small add on to that in regards to the timescales, and, and I absolutely agree. I think it should be timescale for everyone. In that vein, should we have a timescale for reviewing these tools as they come in to make sure they're fit for purpose as well? Uh, absolutely. Um, I mean, I think it's it's opportune to review those existing tools before we then extend anything um, but beyond mm -hmm. what we've already got. But yes, that's that in in itself. You know, therein lies the problem that, uh, <laughs> yeah, it, you know, the provision of care has changed. Are mm -hmm. those tools that we've currently got uh, still fit for purpose? And they may be, but that needs to be tested. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. Thank thanks. you very much. Emma Harper. Thank you. It's uh, good morning, everybody, and thanks for um, being here with us this morning. I welcome this morning's generally positive approach to the health and care staff and bill, and I'm aware that the existing tools that are currently in place are under review right now as we move forward and see other tools being developed. And I'm aware that, you know, we're talking about training and, and continued professional development. And there is a lot of crossover work between physios and um, radiographers, for instance, as well, where they might perform similar tasks that nurses do. So there is a standardised approach out there, I believe, that can be... I guess, assigned to different job descriptions, whereas if radiographers are putting in cannulas, it's the same cannula training that the nurses undergo, or same as hand washing, infection control measures. These are national LearnPro or e-learning modules that are put out there. So as we move this training out, I, I think if all the local authorities have access to community Learn Pro, acute care Learn Pro, there is a standard approach that then can be um, access. I'm, I'm assuming that would be the way to move forward so that we're not reinventing the wheel. And uh, I take on uh, Tracy's, um, I guess, issue that we've got to start somewhere with the bill. And yes, let's look at health uh, and then the care setting and then the individual workers and social care. So I would be interested in just further thoughts about training um, and development and how do we assure a standard approach across the, the setting. Yes, yeah, so we're certainly um, looking at how we can modernise the um, toolkit and make it available for everybody. So, for example, LearnPro is one of the platforms. We've also now in NES got Turas Learn, uh, which we're working with um, social care um, to implement across the whole sector, uh, making things available via, via social media apps, all that sort of thing, to make it easier for people, especially the workforce we're talking about um, here who could be in somebody's home um, how do they get access to learning resources? So we are working on you putting the same resource in place, but available for everyone. So mm -hmm. definitely. Any other thoughts on that question? Tracy Darling. Um, I completely agree. It would be great to have a single platform and that everybody had access to it. Um, it doesn't exist in local government. Uh, there is no single training platform. There are uh, a, a whole range of... Uh, variations on that theme that various local authorities have either bought themselves or have bought into as part of a consortium. But to the best of my knowledge, Cosla could probably tell you better than me, but I don't think there is a single platform within uh, the local authority element. But that doesn't mean that that can't be part of the broader integration um, kind of discussion that needs to take place. Okay. Thanks very much, Emma. OK, no, that's good, thanks. Excellent. Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Kibina. I think uh, the, the, the sort of, if, we, if we look at the sort of complexity of the sort of the health and, and, and social care uh, landscape, I wonder how the sort of workforce planning it, it, it would be best to be approached to achieve, achieve a sort of whole system viability, given the, the multidisciplinary uh, needs uh, within within the sector, and, and does the bill enable that? Will the bill enable that sort of think that kind of thinking and that sort of planning? 
I think that's a, a very good question, and that probably reflects some of the concerns that we come from as a professional body, in that currently um, perhaps that uh, needs to be strengthened if it truly <coughs> does apply that whole system approach. Um, within the dietetic profession, I think that we are increasingly trying to address um, nutrition issues from a whole system perspective. Um, and the example that I use frequently is that if you take the Scottish population, then almost half of the Scottish population has an issue with nutrition, be it overnutrition or undernutrition or some sort of condition that requires therapeutic dietetic intervention, for example, um, a food allergy. And as I said earlier, historically, as a profession, we're very demand-led. Um, so that means that whoever manages to get through our door actually gets our support. But the reality is that it's a much, much bigger population out there that, that requires that support. So we have got examples to date in Scotland where we have taken that whole system approach. And one example of that is um, the issue of celiac disease, which affects a significant proportion of the population. Um, and it requires an assessment of symptoms, a diagnosis, and dietary intervention. A gluten-free diet is the primary intervention. And over a period of time, we have tested and subsequently completely redesigned that approach on a Scotland-wide basis whereby now there is greater assurance that people who are experiencing symptoms are assessed, that they are diagnosed, that they do receive dietetic intervention, and that they also get access to a gluten-free diet and prescribed gluten-free products in a much more cost-effective way. Now, that's required that whole system approach. So that means that's involved dietitians, but it's also involved general practitioners. It's involved cas uh, consultant gastroenterologists, specialist nurses, community pharmacists. And it's not until we sat down with all these disciplines and individuals experiencing that condition that we could look back and reflect on a much better way of doing it, which is that whole system approach. And so if you applied a workforce tool specifically to dietetics, um, that wouldn't actually answer the question as to what number of dietitians, what um, expertise of dietetics, which level of um, experience of dietetics is required in order to um, address that area. Um, of, of, of nutrition need, unless you took that whole system multidisciplinary approach. Tony Arthur. Um, I mean, obviously, workforce planning takes place at the moment. Um, I think what, what the bill might, ho hopefully, what the bill would do was uh, to make that put that into legislation so that it's, it, it's done better and um, staffing and safe staffing is, in, is increased. Um, I think what might be a slight problem with the bill is if um, it does just only apply to nurses and midwives and that that is a um, there's too much emphasis on that and their their numbers are funded because they, they apply the tools and that's why we think that the tools need to be applied across the system and with diagnostics um, doesn't matter how many nurses you're going to have if, if you, you don't know how um, what's wrong with the patient so the diagnosis is absolutely crucial to the to the, the journey for a, for a patient and also in, in uh, treatment and counseling, radiotherapy, uh, that was obviously crucial as well. So we did have the right numbers to make sure you get, get through the waiting lists um, and plus have enough people around in, in accidents and emergency to make sure those diagnoses is, 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 is taken through. Tracy Darling. I think it's one of the benefits of the, of the, of the integration joint boards that we are able to take a more holistic look at workforce planning across the whole of the social care mm -hmm. setting rather than just in a local authority sense or in a, an NHS sense because one of the things that I'd be keen that, that the bill does deliver is that multidisciplinary approach and we don't continue to do things in silos because I don't think it's serving as well. Um, there is, it, it would be remiss of me not to say, although the bill can't provide for it, well maybe it could if you wanted to, but unless we address pay in the social care setting, mm -hmm. um, then we're never going to have um, enough staff uh, in 
in the social care setting, the recruitment and retention of staff is a huge problem. It's one of the things that has been thrown up time and time again when we do look at workforce planning. We do do an analysis about the, the ageing workforce, particularly in social care, in the... In the uh, in the in the root, blah, 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 I can't even get my words out. Certainly, in the more rural communities, we know how many people live and work within that local authority setting. Particularly in social care, the percentages are enormous. People don't travel well to provide that kind of service. They want to do it in their own community. And as they age, uh, as we, as Tesco's opened as a new store and pays more than what they're paying home care workers, um, and as career pathways seem limited to them then um, you know, these are issues that are not going to go away simply because we've got a tool to measure it. All it will do, I think, probably is, is, is throw it into a sharper focus. Yeah, on a more general note, though, um, I think there's no doubt that consistent application of a common staffing method will improve workforce planning. If, those, if that common staffing method is interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, um, or even, as is at the moment in most cases, unidisciplinary, it does improve workforce planning. It gives you more data on which to base your workforce planning. So going forward, I think it is the right direction of travel. Just, just to, to, to take it a little bit further, I think there's a, this sort of dilemma with it within the bill. I think it's it's reasonably it's a reasonable lack of, of, of prescriptiveness, if that's if that's a word. Um, and I wonder if that in itself would be u useful in terms of you know sort of developing an integrated way of developing the workforce, or do we need to be more? Does it need to be more prescriptive than it currently is? Um, um, I don't think so. I think that the strength of the current methodology is, as um, Anne Gow said, about the professional judgment and the quality mm. um, issues, because you can have a slightly different staffing level, but have, or you could have a better staffing level and poorer quality. Mm. So there is definitely something about leaving it um, loose enough to have mm. professional judgment and look at quality and not define a ratio or a number or uh, get too tight. Um, for me, that is important. Tony Axel. Um, I mean, I, when I looked at the bill, I was a little bit surprised to one two one see how prescriptive that that particular table is there. And I, I would have thought that's something you would normally see in a schedule. I mean, I realise that in such in part three it says that many new regulations to change that, but it does seem quite prescriptive that it mentions for something they're, they're saying at the same time saying multidisciplinary tools and apply to the professions. Yet yeah, it's quite a prescriptive table. Uh, on sitting on the bill. I was slightly surprised by that. Yeah, your point. Thanks very much. I mean, I, I guess one obvious question would be if Karen Wilson is right and, and you need to have that uh, resort to professional judgment uh, and that professional judgment might produce a different outcome from simply applying the tool, is the tool ever necessary at all? Well, it does give you a basic methodology that, and again, if it's consistently applied and regularly applied, then I think it gives you a much more sound basis for why you're doing things. Otherwise, it is just, just professional judgment, which, you know, might work, but we, we've had professional judgment for a long time, and we do feel that the workload measurement tools are an improvement because there's a rationale and evidence base behind them. So I think it's the merging of both that's the strength of it rather than one or the other. If that's the case, is there a risk that because the bill is coming in at a point when we have workforce tools in a number of areas, mostly in nursing and midwifery, is there a risk that that skews the allocation of resources, the allocation of uh, time and effort uh, away from other se section sectors into those sectors where the, the tools already are there? Uh, Joyce Thompson. I think there is a risk of that, unless due regard is given to the other groups within the NHS. Tracy Darling. It was designed to go beyond the NHS, so uh, we need to extend beyond that. You know, we, have, we have staffing tools that prescribe staff ratios, in, uh, particularly in the, in the early years setting. Uh, we know absolutely how many early years practitioners we have to X number of children on, and, you know, it's arguable that you could be prescriptive. The difficulty is going to be coming up with something that allows that, allows that to happen without losing the, the kind of 
the, the very real professional view about what is appropriate, uh, and we get wedded to something that's simply about numbers and not about quality. Um, so I think it's a very difficult one to answer, very difficult one to answer, but it can be done. Tony Axon. Yeah, at the moment, um, we're obviously not using the tools in our profession, so it does tend to come down about an argument about numbers. Um, and the, the advantage of the tools is that that professional view is added into that. Um, so it's just a scan, you know, doesn't take so many minutes for each person that comes through that door. So knowing that you need to allow extra times. Um, for example, in a, in a children's department, you can't, it takes longer to scan someone who's a child because they, they won't stand still in front of the, front of the machine or, or not be happy on the table. Um, it tends to be easier to maybe on an adult situation. So knowing those different positions is useful. But also allowing for, um, in some areas, in rural and uh, uh, satellite settings, quite often it's small numbers of staff there. But then you need to allow for the fact you, that um, if somebody goes off, it's a greater proportion of the staff, so you need to allow for that. So having that professional view rather than just the numbers don't um, only require so many. Um, and at, at the moment, I spend a lot of time arguing about how many staff you do need on rotors because of that. You mentioned earlier in, in uh, answer to a previous question the, que the issue of where responsibility would lie uh, within uh, a team for running the tools. Do panel members see any risks with the way that the tools are currently applied and, and may be applied under the bill that responsibility for quite significant staffing issues uh, is seen to rest with somebody in a relatively junior, in a, a, an over, a, a supervisory, a charge nurse or equivalent post rather than management for staffing levels, which may have wider consequences and implications. Tracy Darling. Uh, I, think, I think it's less about who's running the tool than about whether it, it's being run using a kind of ideal standard or whether it's being run using the reality of the situation, and that will come down to frequency. So you might have an ideal standard of operating across the year, and then you hit a real winter pressure, for example, or a flu epidemic or something like that, and it's about are we then launching these tools back into that setting to re-establish what is the reality, or, or re-establish staffing levels based on the reality? Is that reactionary? Is it planned? So I, I'm not so sure about... If, it's, if, if the people who are, are operating the, stu the tools understand them and, and, and are, are perfectly capable and competent in their job, I'm, I think it's less about them and more about at what stage do we do it, how frequently do we do it, and, um, and is it about realities or is it about uh, some kind of, of ideal standard that we're trying to, trying yeah. to deliver? I believe that it's um, important to empower the um, frontline person in charge to um, operate the measurement tools um, and be responsible for that. We think that um, there's enough evidence to suggest that um, the culture of the clinical area in our case um, is dictated by that person um, and that therefore giving them the more power and um, giving more education and allowing them to be in charge and be the linchpin is vitally important. So. We think that, that it sits at the right level. There is obviously then a discussion up the hierarchy with, so we do see the managers, the clinical managers being important as well, as well in, or in um, relation to making sure they completely understand the tools and how to apply them, etc. cetera. Um, so I think there's a hierarchical thing, but I think it's important that frontline leaders um, are given that leadership role. Attorney Axon. I was about to say very similar things actually that um, you, you need to have the it needs to be down enough that it, it, the professional view can be can be implemented but the bill um, puts the emphasis on, on the on the health board in the end so it has to be a management level and a hierarchy as well to look at that thanks very much are there are there for witnesses any unintended potential consequences of the bill that we haven't yet uh, touched on uh, that you think committee members should be aware of 
I just wanted to mention, and this might have been part of what Brian was trying to get at, um, about making sure that the um, tools themselves have enough um, in them to allow people time to do CPD. So the predictable absence in uh, the case of the current tools, um, whether that's enough time um, and whether it gets eaten away by other things like sickness absence, etc. Um, I think it's really important that we get that right for staff. Uh, um, I would ag agree with that point um, and, and echo that point and likewise again point out that um, professions like dietetics whilst they have got a very important direct patient facing role um, because of the, the magnitude of the issue of nutrition it means that dietitians have also got a very, very important role supporting others in the delivery of care at the earliest point in order to ensure that the right person gets the right nutrition intervention at the right time and in, and in the right place. So I think that one would just want to raise caution that to ensure that um, any workforce planning tool uh, didn't specifically or only look at um, areas where it was only patient-facing um, activity. Thank you very much. Tony, yeah, I mean, certainly as a, the concern that sort of has been mentioned earlier about um, taking resources away, away from some from the other areas, if it's just the tools applied to nursing and midwifery, and certainly got um, that seemed to happen to some extent in Wales when, when the, the bill was introduced there. Um, so that is, is a concern. Also, another concern might be if the tools are set if um, not correctly done so that they were seen almost as a maximum for the numbers of staff rather than mm -hmm. um, setting a, an idea of how many staff there should be. No. Tracy Darling. Um, I think possibly the escalation and the enforcement element of it is, is perhaps not, not there in the sense that we would like to see. I don't think it's clear at all about where that responsibility lies. Is it with the integrated joint board? Is it with individual employers? You know, wh wh where does the buck stop? Very good question, Brian Whittle. I've just picked up as I thought I had. There was around this idea of resource management um, and and where the, where you think the bill and the tools they, they currently sit. And to your point, um, um, who's ultimately responsible? Who's got who's got the ultimate responsibility of that? And what's the, what is the repercussions uh, of perhaps not hitting? Or falling short of of the the, the of, of what the the, uh, the the tool suggests is safe safe staffing. Where 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 is that where is that does that lead us down a dark path? We have the care commission at the moment, so the you know individuals are free to report to the care commission, and the care commission are free to inspect and and take whatever enforcement action uh, they feel necessary. But I do think there is. That there's a critical kind of question to be answered about. Okay, so if there is a problem, it's all very well the care commission coming in and and and, and recommending a whole range of measures, and they will continue to monitor that to make sure that it's safe. But um, if we have a bill here around staffing, who who picks that up? Who picks that? Up? Is it the integrated joint board on the social care setting? Is it the health board in, in an acute setting? Um, or are it, and, and certainly from, from a unison point of view, we have thousands of people working for very small employers. Um, you know, does, the, does the responsibility sit with them or does it sit back with the integrated joint board because they commissioned that, that, you know, that employer to deliver that service? And I don't think that's clear at all. Uh, Tony yeah. um, Well, very much at the moment, we see that staff levels can get driven by, by how much finances there are. Um, so there's an interesting question about resource management that um, the duty is going to be on the board but um, it's up to how much money that comes from the government whether they can meet the, the right staffing levels so there is an issue with the financial note on this one that it's talking about introducing the tools and how much money that might cost but it's not talking necessarily about how many more staff you might need if, if these are, tools are applied appropriately Indeed. Um, and, yeah, I think um, it's clear for the NHS that the board, the board, uh, the buck stops at the board. Um, I do th just think there's an important issue about resource versus quality. 
um, and you know that it's important to put as much emphasis on the quality of care as on the number of staff. Um, and I think um, it has made that quite clear this morning that it's about the bigger picture, safety, quality and number of staff. Okay. Thank you very much. David Stewart. Uh, thank you, Peter. Um, my, my questions are around accountability and responsibility, and my questions are mainly towards Unison, and could just draw my members' attention to the fact that I'm a member of Unison. Um, Theresa Darling, in your submission, uh, you made an interesting um, suggestion that st the staffing bill might be ignored, and the general points, and I paraphrase your lines, you're concerned about shortage of staff, lack of enforcement and con uh, constrained resources. Will the bill resolve any of these factors? I think we're back to the compliance point. Um, we know from our own experience, perhaps a good example of it, that uh, the Scottish living wage being applied in the social care setting uh, was money released by um, Scottish Government came to integrated uh, joint boards and was then released to various providers of services. Um, but we are still pursuing those providers of the services to pay the, the employees. The money is sitting with them uh, and hasn't been passed on appropriately. So if that's a parallel, then it worries me that we have another piece of, of legislation or uh, it, that we have the Health and Safety at Work Act and we've had it for decades and we've got employers that ignore mm. it so it's mm. about compliance i think um if you're going to put something in place and you're looking for adherence we need to know who's responsible for that adherence and frankly what the penalties are if you don't i mean in a simplistic level um, everyone in this room wants to see better staffing levels and better care um but what's your assessment of what the post act world will look like in terms mm -hmm. of care provision and in terms of staffing provision? What do I think it will look like? Mm. I'm not sure it's going to look any different than it does just now, mm. uh, if, I, if I'm really honest. I don't think this is any kind of panacea. Um, we are desperately short of staff um, who are not well paid. They're low paid workers. They live in their local communities. I'm not sure where we're going to get them from um, mm. to continue to, to, to work in this area. Perhaps if it was a safer environment. There were more people providing that service who were better paid and better supported and trained. And they knew that when things went wrong, that there was there was a degree of enforcement. Then perhaps if we piece all of those parts of the puzzle together, it will look better. But this in itself, sorry, mm. no, I, I can't see it making a, an enormous change. Mm. Not in the social care setting and mm. not at this stage. Mm. Um, Americans have a line about where's the beef, um, yeah. trying to verify whether there's a real substance here. Is there some elements of that? Certainly some of our witnesses, not all, some of our witnesses suggested that we don't need legislation to have workforce tools. These are internal management issues. I, I would agree. I, I'm, I'm never going to say don't legislate for something that I firm, firmly believe is the right thing to do, um, provided it comes with, I'm, just, I'm going over the same ground here, provided it comes with an element of enforcement. Um, and the legislation might give us that if it is couched in that way. But uh, colleagues are absolutely correct. You don't need legislation to introduce workforce planning tools. Yeah. And my final question, uh, Convener. Obviously, there's existing um, uh, provisions across all the public sector and beyond for whistleblowing. And I think, again, everyone would support that. Um, but if you have scenarios in the future where staff who work in care sectors are very um, upset with the current staffing yeah. rate rotas, just to give you an example. Is there anything this bill will do which will add to the provision of staff and empower staff to come forward to the appropriate agency to say, this is not good enough, this is putting uh, patients at risk? As it's currently written, hmm. no. The enforcement's not there. The, the degree of comfort around doing that is not there. Right. Thank you, Convener. Thank you very much. Alec Cole-Hampton. Thank you, Convener. Good morning to the panel. Um, I'd like to pick up on uh, David Stewart's line of questioning around the impact on staff, because when we introduce tools, that's uh, us telling staff this is how things ought to be done. Um, but I'm concerned that that flow only goes in one direction. Are colleagues on the panel confident that this bill will build in mechanisms for staff who know their onions in their day-to-day -day work to... Uh, inform and suggest meaningful changes to how these tools operate on the ground? Karen Wilson. Um, certainly when uh, we first introduced the tools to nursing and midwifery, it did empower charge nurses. 
Um, it gave them information they didn't have before. It gave them a methodology they didn't have before. And it gave them a language to talk to the clinical nurse managers and beyond up to the nurse directors. So I think to that extent, having consistent tools can help. How, well, if I can add as a corollary then, mm -hmm. how um, responsive will this strata of tools be to sort of um, upward suggestion for change from the ground? Um, again, at the moment um, in the nursing, I'm sorry to go on about nursing and midwifery uh, to my colleagues, but uh, the nurse directors are really interested in the outcome of running the tools. So it does matter to um, the quality and safety of um, clinical care delivery. So where they're available, they are um, used. But and are you content that there is a feedback loop built into the legislation which will allow that to be uh, nuanced and, and changed based on practice and uh, the, the application of these tools on the ground? Well, again, I'm with um, colleagues here that I'm not sure that the bill does have the teeth it needs. Um, okay. I think it comes. I think it comes to governance, and there's different arrangements with different employers in terms of that staff engagement, and it, and the question's been asked about how low level will staff engagement be around around using these tools, and you know, in a social care setting, I'm not convinced it will go right down. Um, in which case, we're potentially missing a trick there because we won't have that level of engagement. Um, so, uh, the bill encourages employers. To seek views, I think it needs to be stronger than that. That there needs to be absolute engagement um, at all levels of all of the organisation, particularly on the, you know, out there in terms of frontline delivery staff. They know their onions uh, and should be engaged in the process, even if they're not using the tool. They should be at, there should be a mechanism by which their view of what's currently happening can be elicited, uh, and they can engage in the process. Doris Thompson. I agree with these comments. I think that you know one of the key learnings over the last few years is that you can't do two, you have to do with, and that means irrespective of um, what your profession, your grade, or, or whomever you, you sit alongside. So I think from that perspective, engagement both in terms of development, but also in the testing and the application of the tools is absolutely um, essential. Um, and just reflecting as well that, for example, um, w when you look at a dietetic service, not all dietetic services consist of services which contain nothing other than dietitians, and not all dietitians are in a dietetic service. So there's different um, means by, or the, there's different um, examples of where dietitians will sit in organisations. Um, and therefore um, that places different types of pressures on the individuals. So it's important that um, that's taken into consider consideration as well. Thank you very much. Keith Bryan. Sorry, Liz. Uh, oh, sorry, Tony. Yeah, just to, to add to that, the, the, um, the point about the tools is that there is a professional element to them, not just about, it's not just about the numbers. But I would add that um, in the sections in here that uh, about training, consultation of staff, etc., where it would be helpful if the professional body were included in these in the face of the bill. Okay. Uh, I'm just uh, interested in Unison's approach. I noticed in the written submission that they were unable to identify any strengths in the bill, either in part two or part three, um, although I have raised a number of other issues of concern, including pay, which we've discussed a fair bit um, here today. I should say I speak as an ex shop student branch officer for Unison as well, but. On the pay issue, I'm not sure how the Scottish Government could have enforced compliance on a living wage. It doesn't have that legal power to do that. But in relation to the point that you made, Tracy, earlier on, when you said one of the things that would happen with the implementation of this bill you feared would be that it would throw into sharper focus the issue of pay, I think it was in relation to recruitment in particular. Is that not a good thing? If, 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 if the bill does do that, if it's the various tools set out a particular standard um, and professional judgment backs that up, and that demonstrates a shortfall in the staffing that's there, would that not be a pressure in the system to enforce higher levels of pay, greater uh, recruitment and adequate staffing? Absolutely, it would. 
but I'm not sure where you're going to get the bodies from, where the money's coming from, um, in order to address those. It's linked largely with the workforce planning. Um, we are seriously short of people who see care, not nursing, care as, as a career. Uh, young people are not coming in um, to that profession. They don't see it as a profession, they don't see it as a career, and they certainly see that they're never going to make more than living wage, as things currently stand, or thereabouts. Uh, in, in, t in terms of salary. So um, it, there's, a, there's a whole cultural aspect to this um, that I think, yes, the bill and its provisions and the staffing tools may well throw that into sharp focus and we'll see it uh, in, its, in its really stark uh, terms rather than perhaps anecdotally as we see it just now. But there are, there are a whole range of things that are going to have to happen in order to address the problems that, that I think this will, this, this will throw up. Tony Axon. Yeah. Um, I think retention is absolutely crucial uh, at the moment. We've got, um, uh, we have got uh, for radiographers a, a vacancy rate about 4% at the moment, which varies from year to year. But we have got also a cap on the number of people that can, can be trained because you've got to go through the hospital system to be trained. So there's a limited number of spa spaces in there. And I think we've had. Um, in the hospital setting, in the NHS setting, obviously we just had a, um, a change to the, the pay scales. I was heavily involved in, in developing the new pay scales, and I think that might help in, re in retention. But what certainly will help in retention is if there's not so much pressure on staff um, to, to cover for other people. There's, there's a lot of, at the moment, there's a lot of people going off of sick because they're uh, through stress, because of the, the pressures on, on them to uh, cover rotors and... and having to do weekend work and overnight work and if we manage to increase the numbers of staff and make that a better workplace then that's going to help in, in, in keeping people in, in post. Okay. Thank you very much. Just a quick supplementary. Um, Karen, I don't think you should apologise for nursing tools because they've been in existence for 10 years. It's what we have right now and it's what we can build on. So I'd be interested to see how can the panel engage in the future development of tools f that would apply to the multidisciplinary teams, whether it's community, whether it's care in the home, or whether it is acute care, because you're all articulating very well ab about the need for a multidisciplinary approach. So I would, uh, I guess I'm seeking to know whether you would be engaging in the development of tools for your own disciplines, whether they're pigeonholed or whether they're multidisciplinary team approach? Tony Axon. Um, I think the simple answer to that would be, yes, we would be looking to do that. And I've already um, speak, spoke to some of my colleagues in, in RCN, et cetera, that are using those tools and looking at um, how they could e uh, be moved across. And, and it, for radiographers, it's possibly slightly easier because they tend to be um, employed in hospitals in the main. Um, dealing with waiting lists or dealing with A&E departments, which are quite similar to nursing roles anyway. Uh, and, and as you said earlier, that, that some of the training modules would apply to radiographers. So I, there's maybe an easier gain on that one. Um, for some of the uh, colleagues in, in our health professionals, it might be more difficult. But I, could, I, I would say definitely, yes, we would be looking to engage with the, the development of those tools. Mm -hmm. Thompson. I would say that we would welcome the opportunity um, very much, um, particularly from a multidisciplinary uh, perspective. And in order to do so, that means that it has to be made an explicit priority. Um, and there also needs to be appropriate resource to support the development of them. Okay. Thank you very much. And can I thank our witnesses uh, once again this morning for another very useful session. Uh, we'll suspend very briefly to allow witnesses to speak. Thank you very much.
Uh, for the moment, to deal with agenda item number two, which is in relation to the European Union Withdrawal Act 2018. This is our first consideration of a proposal by the Scottish Government to consent to the UK Government legislating using the powers under the European Union Withdrawal Act in relation to a UK statutory instrument. That statutory instrument is the Tobacco Products and Nicot Nicotine Inhaling Products Amendment EU exit regulations of 2018. Colleagues will have seen the paper from the clerks which sets out the protocol which is in place between the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government on obtaining the approval of the Parliament to the exercise of powers by UK ministers under the Withdrawal Act in relation to proposals which fall within the legislative competence of the Scottish Parliament. Provisions in these regulations, to the extent that they are within devolved competence, are considered by ministers to fall uh, within category A, as described in the protocol. In other words, they are uh, relatively minor and largely technical in detail. Now, what is exceptional here is that the UK Government wish to propose to lay these regulations on the 10th of October. They are keen to do so in order to provide sufficient lead-in time for all concerned. Therefore, uh, with our October recess starting on the 6th of October, the Scottish Government as an exception, is seeking approval to uh, proceed within a shorter time scale than the 28 days outlined in our protocol. So the paper which members will have seen invites uh, you to consider the not notification from the government and for us to decide if we are content for the Scottish Government to give consent to UK ministers in the way described. Do, do members have any views on that matter that they wish to raise at this stage? I think, therefore, we will... Um, okay. Can I ask a question, first of all, in relation to the timing? Uh, first of all, I'm obviously more than willing to accept the UK Government wants to do this to give as much leading time. A bit more concerned why two, more than two years since the referendum, this is how long it's taken to do it, and we're having to do it in a truncated process. The point, though, that the government, Scottish Government has to ensure the UK Government is aware of Scottish Parliament recess periods. Can you just check that? It's a fairly obvious question. That has been done. So the UK government was aware of our recess period. Yes, indeed. And it's taken this long for them to come um, to, which I think is less than satisfactory to do. And also, and I, I don't know enough about this, I'm probably maybe the only smoker here right enough, but um, it does mention at uh, page five about that one thing that, that can be affected by this is decreasing the maximum emission levels. That seems to be more than... Technical. Presumably that could have a, an impact on stakeholders and producers. I should say one interest I would declare. I've got a company in my constituency which produces the um, filters and packaging for cigarettes, which is its only business. But that would seem to be more than... I, I don't know, I'm just asking the question whether that's more than a technical or minor possible change. I understand the stuff about the advertising and the packaging and so on, but maximum emission level seems to be a bit of a different thing. In, in the sense of substituting for existing regulations, then minor and technical would apply. But certainly, that's an, we, we have enough time to take evidence uh, next week, if, if, if you would wish us to do that, in order to get to the bottom of that and, and be clear well, on maybe the whether this is a change in substance. Well, it depends on how the committee... Maybe the questions can be answered. Now, the one other thing I was wondering is, if this is agreed, and for whatever reason... Brexit doesn't happen, or at least happen at the schedule. What happens to these powers? They just they just don't get used. Is that right? Or yes, I mean I think I've, uh, my reading of it is that they come in at such point as the EU regulations and only to apply. Then. Yeah, yeah, that's my understanding of this. I have to say, if you think this one is late, this is actually the first. So um, be 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 aware that we may have quite a lot of these regulations coming through over the next few months. So the decisions we make. Clearly, the decision we make about this, which is, is the only one we will see before, I think, before the October recess, is a standalone decision. Um, but we will have to think carefully about how closely we wish to interrogate other ma matters that come before us, because after October, there could be quite a lot of them coming forward quite quickly. Do other members feel the need to explore this further before giving assent? Or, um, um, we can certainly do that if, 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 if you're keen. Are you, are you happy with that? OK, in that case, we will indicate the Scottish Government we're content for them to do so. I think we should put on the record that um, we take their assurance that of this 
truncated time scale, um, we will uh, expect them to hold to their commitment that this is exceptional and will not be standard. Uh, we do want to see these things in enough time to take evidence, should we so wish, uh, and that, uh, in terms of what comes before this committee, is the responsibility of the Scottish Government, although clearly there are um, backstories to all of that as well. Okay, if we are agreed, and we will therefore uh, uh, notify the Scottish Government accordingly and let them know that we are content um, that they should proceed as described. We will now move into private session. <laughs>